I'd like to thank you all for choosing to spend your lunch time wisely by attending this workshop. It definitely feels good to be part of something that helps us grow as a person, professionally and mentally. October 2005 is when I joined Toastmasters. So, nine years. I'm thinking if someone has been doing something for nine years, you better have something to show for it, right? <laughs> I mean, think about somebody going to college for nine years. You gotta have something to show, right? An associate degree, something. But <clears throat> I may have been a member of Toastmasters for nine years now. I may have won three area level contests. But that is not what this is about. This is really about sharing what I've learned and making other members successful and excited about one, joining Toastmasters, and two, utilizing the skills that we learn in Toastmasters and which we are still continually learning to achieve our life goals. I think that's what this is about. So, about evaluating a speech. A speaker gets up on stage and speaks about any kind of talk, um, topic. And now it's time to evaluate the speaker. So you as the evaluator get up on stage and you have to do a very good job of evaluating what you just heard. So I'd like to start with pretty much according to Chambers Dictionary, evaluation means, the word evaluate means to form an idea or judgment about the worth of something. So let's, for a minute, focus on the word something and judgment. And before I move on any further, how many of us would like this workshop to just be you sitting there listening to me the whole one hour, or we get it to be interactive, where we get to do some role play, we get to get involved. I think statistics has shown that we all learn a lot more when we are hands-on, when we get our hands dirty. So option A, you just sit and listen to me, boring. Or option B, we all get involved. Option B, option A? Option B. B, option all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So to demonstrate this definition of evaluate, who would like to speak a little bit about your smartphone? Basically, why you bought that smartphone, the things you like about the smartphone. Anyone? Just to kind of give us a little demo and kind of make us kind of get involved. Who has a smartphone? All right, Bill, go ahead. So, so when you bought the smartphone, did you, did you have to make any decision regarding other smartphones at the time before you arrived at that smartphone? Yeah, I, I figured there was probably two, two, two real, real choices and that was either to get the iPhone, which is the Apple um, platform, or a, an Android. I, I think there are other op, there were other options out there, but those were the two ones I really seriously considered. Um, and I just chose um, Android because it's a little more open. The Apple, the iPhone's really locked down, and it, it works well. It, it, it doesn't um, malfunction a whole lot, but there's not a lot of customization or any of that sort of thing you can do. Um, Apple's a little easier to use out of the box. Mm -hmm. I think the, uh, the Android has a little more functionality, but you know, the main thing is, you, know, you can look at this, at the time when I bought this, Apple didn't have a big screen, and since I'm blind as a bat, I, I opted for the big screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's why I chose that. It was a pretty, pretty easy decision for me. Thank you, Bill. So do we all agree that Bill just gave us a two minute evaluation speech about his smartphone? Mm -hmm. Pretty much, why he chose that smartphone. So I've come up with about six rules that has made me able to win a couple of awards and a couple of contests. Just six rules that I've used, and I will continue to use these rules as I move forward. The number one rule really is you have to either like it or force yourself to like it to form a good opinion or judgment. In this case, Let's try to replace the like it of the smartphone for the speaker and the speech. Yeah, I mean, you get up there, 
obviously you listened to the speech, you took your notes, and then you, you, you just have to get up there and say positive things about the speaker. It makes sense. Now, before I get to rule number two, let me ask one more question. <clears throat> Who among us has ever bought a thing, something, a shoe, a car, something? Probably partly or mainly because your friend also bought the same thing. Could be your friend, could be your wife, could be your husband, could be your cousin. And let me remind us, we may not be doing this a lot now because we are all grown ups and we are all adults, but I'm sure we did this a lot as teenagers. Think about it. I know I had a friend that had, all of a sudden, he bought this one brown suede shoe and I just wanted to have that shoe really, really bad. And he was my best friend. So I'm trying to do an analogy here. So who among us has, maybe in the past, bought something because your friend had it? And what was it? A VW Beetle. A VW Beetle. Exactly. I like that. Who else in this room has liked or likes VW Beetle? Exactly. Thank you, Mario. So here's what we will do. Janet is going to tell us the things that she liked about the VW Beetle. And when she's done, probably why, probably why she bought it. And then when she's done, Mario is also going to tell us about the VW Beetle and why he would have liked to buy it or why he bought it. And then what we'll do is let us listen to not just the what, <clears throat> meaning the VW Beetle and the features and how safe it is, but also the why and the how, meaning how they both present it. And then at the end, let us now vote and see which of these descriptions would convince us to go out and buy a VW Beetle. There's something I'm going with this, and, I, and, and this is going to be fun. So Janet, do you mind? Go ahead. This was back in about 1968, and I was a poor, starving college student, and someone, a neighbor, offered to sell me her VW Beetle for about $300. And when you're a poor starving college student, a car for $300 looks pretty good. Now, it didn't hurt that my boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, also had a VW Beetle. He had bought his brand new because he had parents who could afford it. But the VW Beetle was very functional in spite of the snow and the cold. The thing I liked best about it was driving on ice. This car would drive this thing on ice, and it would spin on the ice, and it would go 360 degrees, and you would just keep on driving. <laughs> Your passengers, meanwhile, have had various inappropriate physical reactions to your driving skills, but nevertheless, the car did the trick. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mario, you're shot. <clears throat> my brother, when I was in college, was going to Hawaii, and he had this Volkswagen with a blown engine, and he needed the cash, and he came to me, and he said, I need the cash, and he knew I knew how to take the engine apart and fix it, so he said, I'll sell it to you really cheap, and he sold it to me for $500, and it was more than, than a blown, uh, an engine, a Volkswagen with a blown engine would cost, but I thought, well, he's my brother, I'm going to give him a little extra. And uh, he's moving to Hawaii. And uh, so I uh, took the engine out, rebuilt it. And right about the time my wife and I were talking about getting married, she helped me put it in and we put it together. And, and then I had a, a almost brand new car. And I actually sold that car and started a business with the cash. I built, I bought my first computer with the cash from that car. So that's, uh, that's one of those uh, computer stories <coughs> before, uh, it was, this was in the late 70s. Nice, thank you. thank you. How many of us in this room would, at the time or even right now, go out there and buy a VW Beetle based on Mario's description? How many of us based on Janet's description? <laughs> Grace, I would buy I see, one anytime. I see, I, I, I actually that saw. Price, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I actually saw an extra hand up for Janet. 
So my point here is the second rule that I've used. You have to package it, the speaker in your speech, and present it like it's gold with just a little bit of blemish. So Janet did a, a much better job of packaging it and presenting it. And she got most of us sold. You know, the pricing, the functionality, the features, how it went on <coughs> ice, just a lot. And so this, this is a, a pretty, a very good useful role whereby you're packaging a speaker in this speech and you're presenting it. You're actually at some point even presenting it to be probably what than what the speech really was. But see, that's your job. That's your job to really bring out and analyze the speech. And then maybe as far as the blemish, you, you always have to give one suggestion for improvement. That is something that is expected by Toastmasters. So that drives my point. And that's the rule number two. Now, let's assume this was an evaluation contest. So how many of us agree that Jenny would probably have won the first prize, right? Exactly. So, can you win the lottery if you don't play? No, right? Right? You gotta play to win. Exactly. So, that drives my third point. You have to compete to win in these competitions. You just have to. You have to compete, call it competition, call it play, whatever it is. Have fun with it. But you have to. You just have to. And <clears throat> let's just take a minute and look at this <clears throat> ad. This is an ad that was featured by our club in February 2007. Speech is given and contestants give verbal evaluations of the speech. The evaluation is judged by a panel of judges. Winner is awarded a prize. So, this is really how it starts. This is really where it starts. And I will at some point probably mention why I choose this particular ad. But as I was putting this presentation together, I thought to myself, and, and actually this is, this is the competition that I contested as well. Now keep in mind, I joined the club in 2005. I contested in 2007. So again, as I'm putting this together, I pondered and I asked myself, why did it take me two years after joining a club to then compete in a contest, right? And while it would seem logical that I was learning, I was watching, I was trying to understand what it takes for two years, that is really not the truth. The truth is that I have been competing. I just wasn't winning. <laughs> So nobody really cares. Just, just do it. Just get up and dance. I like, <clears throat> I like that. I like that. So I, I went ahead and competed in this, in this contest. How many of us here are aware of the, uh, Michael Jordan, the basketball legend? OK, thank you. Let's try to digest this for a minute. So, if a legend like Michael Jordan could, could, could lose 26 times to take the winning shot, lost 300 games, I mean, had all kinds of failures, but we all know he still came out with one of the greatest that ever played the game. This gave me confidence. This, if Michael Jordan could lose so much and still came out to be the greatest, I think anybody can win. So again, it, you know, it, it just takes our minds back to my earlier point that you gotta compete to win. You gotta play to win. So, what eventually happened was in 2007, I not only did I compete in the local level contest at the club level, but I also went ahead and competed at, at the area level. And that looks really, really dark. But anyway, <laughs> so at the area level, this is the award that I won, which I took second place for the area. But I learned a lot of lessons from that, from that contest. And so when I went back the next time, I actually won first place from learning and watching and observing. But also notice how this first contest was 2007 and this is 2012. What, five years? But again, I mean, this is a process. This is a process that just doesn't happen overnight. 
just like with anything else that we get better at, practice, competing. And, and so this, this brings us to my next rule. The more you compete, the more you learn, grow, and increase your chances of winning. So needless to say, I've, I've been to a lot of contests, I'm sure most of us have been. And it's not just about going to the contest, but it, again, it's also about competing. Just, just give it a shot, try. You know, nobody really cares if you can dance or not, just get up and do it, you know, have fun with it. Now, let me bring back this ad. I know we've seen this ad before, and I know we've seen this guy before. I think we're probably tired of seeing him. But anyway, if we can, for a minute, forget about the date, 2007, and the fact that I won the, I won the area contest in that debate. Let's also just look at the ad itself. This is really your free pass. This is really how it starts. This is really where you get in and join. But also, another thing I want us to look about this ad is this gentleman here. Am I the only one in this room who would like to hear what this gentleman is saying? Just looking at him. Doesn't he look like he knows his stuff? Doesn't he look just confident? I mean, this guy looks like he could sell you a brick and you would buy it. <laughs> My point is, he looks confident. And how do you build confidence? Obviously, from knowledge, right? And I believe that's why we are all here. That's why we are all here to learn, to be knowledgeable, to get the tricks, and to, and, and to get ourselves better. So, on that note, in the next 10 minutes, you're going to listen to a, a, a speech <coughs> by our longtime able, experienced member, Janet. And after the speech, there will be two evaluators evaluating the speech. And again, watch, listen to the evaluators, and at the end, we'll, we'll all take a vote. And like I said, I, I like this to be interactive. I just don't want to stand here myself, talk all day, that's just boring. So we'll all take a vote as to which of the two evaluators that we think did a better job of, the, of evaluating Janet's speech. And then after that, I'll come back and then we'll continue. So, uh, Janet's speech is titled, A Sound of Thunder. A Sound of Thunder, Janet. <laughs> science fiction novels? Have you ever read science fiction novels? Raise your hand if you've read a science fiction novel. When I was in high school, I was a passionate science fiction fan. I read everything. I don't know where my time went except it went between the covers of the science fiction novels. One of the stories I read at that time was written by Ray Bradbury. It was called The Sound of Thunder and it was later made into a movie. The storyline involved a future society which was good and peaceful and happy. And they had just elected a generous and supportive liberal government. <clears throat> One thing they had invented at that time was quite phenomenal. It was the ability to go back into the past and to walk on a slightly elevated pathway so that you didn't touch or alter anything related to what might happen in the future. And that was the rule, the most important rule. Never step off the path. A wealthy hunter paid a large amount of money to go way back to the time of the dinosaurs because he wanted to kill a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Well, his permission was granted and they went back. However, when the Tyrannosaurus Rex appeared, he was so shocked and shaken up that he accidentally stepped off the path. Immediately afterwards, a tree fell on the dinosaur and killed it, which was the intention. Um, they went back immediately to their own civilization, but they found that things had changed. The citizens were not friendly. The spelling of the language was different. And worst of all, a fascist government had been elected to rule the society. Does anyone remember reading this story or seeing the movie? Yep. Okay, we got a few of them in here. Okay, the tour guide checked the hunter out and found that when he stepped off the path, he accidentally crushed a butterfly. And the tour guide raised his gun and shot the hunter.
Hunter. That's the sound of thunder. From this book, though, I developed the belief that something as small as the death of a <clears throat> butterfly could have a major impact on the amount of beauty and happiness and joy and light that we might have in the future. Not just the killing of a butterfly, a small thing, but the saving of a butterfly, a small thing. Several weeks ago, the world was shocked to hear that the offices of Sony Corporation were hacked, most likely by North Korea, in an effort to prevent them from showing a movie that they had produced, which it was a spoof, it was a satire, depicted the assassination of North Korean President Kim Jong-un. Threats along the magnitude of 911 were made to any theater that dare showed this film. If the film opened at the theaters, Sony pulled the film, of course, fearing for people's safety. However, they received a phone call from President Obama and said, I'd really like it if you'd show this movie. So they did. They reconsidered. They showed the film. It was a raunchy comedy. It wasn't exactly a butterfly. It was probably more like a slug. However, they showed the movie. It was successful. And uh, Americans were not prevented from seeing this movie if they chose to do so. Now, I'm glad Sony showed the movie, but studio directors, <coughs> executive directors of motion picture studios now are taking a hard look at the movies that they're producing with an eye to making sure that they're not putting out anything that might offend anyone and cause the same thing to happen to them. So, whereas they sort of saved the butterfly, the impact of the attempt will be, albeit slightly, to take away our freedom of the press and our freedom of speech. The sound of thunder in this particular one, of course, was that China cut off their internet access the next day. However, they did get it back after about 24 hours. Um, but I do believe some harm has already been done. Last week, we again heard the sound of thunder when masked gunmen rushed into the office of Charlie Hebdo uh, in Paris, France, and killed many of the cartoonists who worked for the newspaper. Charlie Hebdo was a self-proclaimed newspaper that satirized everything and everybody. They didn't care who they took on. They took on Christians, they took on Muslims, they took on Jews, they took on short fat people. They took on anybody. And frequently their outrageous editorial cartoons were really offensive. But they didn't care because it was their freedom of speech. And they were firebombed a couple of years ago. And rather than give up their right to their freedom of press and putting out whatever they wanted, they hired a bunch of policemen to come and guard their office. Well, and then the editor stated at that time that he would rather be dead than have his freedom of press repressed. Unfortunately, now he is, as are three of the policemen who were guarding the office and a number of other people. And as most of you know, the men responsible for the murders were found and killed within 48 hours of the attack. There may be some others out there, but they're looking for them. World opinion has overwhelmingly condemned the attack and defended the right of people to speak their minds, even though there may be disagreement as to whether it's appropriate or not. Check out your little handout in the middle of the table. It's kind of yellow colored. It's an editorial cartoon from the Sacramento Bee, which questions whether the Prophet Muhammad would support the killing of cartoonists. And most people recognize that Islam is a religion of peace. All across the world, tens of thousands of individuals, including many from the Muslim community, have gathered in solidarity with the newspaper's right to publish their opinion and wear pins stating, Je suis Charlie, which is I am Charlie. Last weekend, one million people marched in support of Charlie and of freedom. Today, the regular weekly issue of Charlie was published. Three million copies compared to their normal circulation of 60,000. The front cover depicts the Prophet Muhammad with a tear on his cheek, holding a card that says, Je suis Charlie, with a caption that reads, All is forgiven. The cartoonists have decided to take the route of forgiving the murderers. It seems to me that there is a choice here to decide what, what kind of world we want to have, and if we are willing to save the butterfly to make sure our present and our future are the kind of world in which we want to live. 
we can decide whether we have a world where, in spite of our own personal beliefs, we have rights, liberties, freedom, equality. We can decide whether we are willing to take a stand in support of freedom. These rights, not just the right to exercise free speech, the right of assembly, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, all the rights our ancestors fought for and are still fighting for. My question to you is this. Are you willing to take a stand for freedom? Are you willing to say, je suis Charlie? Are you willing to save the butterfly? Thank you. Thank you, Janet, for such an informational speech. So, so what we'll do is we'll do a teamwork here. We'll listen to the uh, evaluators, and then we'll all vote on who we did, did a better job of evaluating general speech. So, first evaluator, we'll call on Grace Fracher. Too. If you haven't read it, I would recommend reading that book, or actually any Ray Bradbury books. He was a very prolific writer. A lot of his books did become films, and <coughs> they're stories that are classics. They never grow old. I like the way that you brought in the audience, asking the questions if they've ever seen or read the book. A red berry. That way you brought the, the uh, audience in. I enjoyed that. I would have enjoyed perhaps illustration, maybe an, uh, a picture of the cover of the book or maybe a flyer of the movie. That would have been interesting. And perhaps, perhaps, if you didn't use notes, that would have been good too. Because we like to see your pretty face looking at us instead of downward. But I enjoyed the speech. I thought it was very good. I enjoyed the way that you brought the current events to the movie and the book. And that's something that's very thought-provoking, not only the movie and the butterfly, but also the current events. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay, moving along, let's call on the second evaluator, Bill Takis. Masters. Uh, Janet's speech, the, the Sound of Thunder, um, was a very wonderful speech, very interesting, and I do like science fiction, so, so that was part of it. Uh, what I, but I really, what I really liked about it was how she um, tied it to, to current events, how she um, tied the unintended consequence of a, a butterfly being um, smashed and, and changing the future to uh, the unintended intended consequences of Sony being hacked and um, affecting our uh, um, free speech. They are curtailing, or at least looking at how they're presenting things so as not to offend people. And um, that's kind of a, a, a chilling thing if you think about it, especially when you compare it to also the um, events that happened in, in France with uh, the bombing of, of that magazine. Uh, 
as far as um, the speech goes, I, you know, I, I, I don't really have much to uh, to complain about. There's nothing to really complain about. It was, um, it was uh, clearly described. She she described the uh, the book, and I felt like I I read the book. It was it was clearly described. Uh, she made very smooth transitions um, in comparisons to, to the present day uh, events, and um, clearly explained the the, uh, the whole speech. So, I, you know, if I were to rate it, I, I'd give it a ten. Thank you. So let's do our formal Toastmasters protocol. Let's just go ahead and use the voting sheet and just do the, the area for best evaluator. Let's just go ahead and write down who we thought did a better job and pass it down to our vote counter, who is Narinda. Narinda time to uh, compile who we thought did the better job of, the work of, of evaluating the speech. I'd like us to get involved here. From my experience, listening to speeches and listening to evaluations and all these contests, and even listening to both evaluators of Janet's speech, what are the things that an evaluator really has to say? to win a contest, things, things that evaluator and, uh, an evaluator has to say or do, maybe areas to cover to win an evaluation contest. And also in line of getting us involved, as you think of something, whatever it is, I want you to come up to the board and pick a, a, a thing here and just write down what it is that, that you brought up or that you think uh, an evaluator should say or do. Who wants to go first? Dave. Okay. You want me to say it? Or you want to... uh, yeah, say it and then come over and just that. Uh... All right, uh, I guess the one I want to say is a good evaluator actually evaluates the speech. Uh, I don't know if you guys noticed. Like, I noticed Grace's evaluation was all about the movie. It didn't really deal with, with Janet's speech. So I guess that's just what I want to say. Like, if you're going to evaluate, make sure you're evaluating the topic that's supposed to be evaluated. Mine. You're tough, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> it always is. So, evaluate this speech. While you're up there, could you write down offer suggestions for improvement? Okay. Suggestion for improvement, okay. Can you guys see that color in the back? There's something glaring on the board. Yeah. Just the light. Maybe the light. I thought your speech was really remarkable because you dealt with heavy issues. How taking a small, doing something small can have huge consequences over time. Um, what happened with Sony, which was um, maybe a tempest in the teapot, I'm not sure, but definitely what happened in Paris was, uh, like people have said, it's the 9-11 for France. Everybody's awake now and everybody, I think, is aware that it could possibly happen even in Sacramento. And instead of making it heavy, I would have made it really heavy. You know, there would have been a solemn hush over here if I could have summoned that up. 
but you didn't. And I was amazed at your ability to articulate the difficult concepts of the three examples and keep it on a really positive note. I don't know how you did that. It's it would have been difficult. What? It's the butterfly. It was the butterfly. <laughs> okay. But what I try to do in the speech is I try and uh, um, hone in on the energy that the speaker has, sometimes not just the concepts, but the energy. And I think that was one of the, um, that, that made it a masterpiece. I'm glad this will be on YouTube because it deserves to be on YouTube because of the way you discussed the relevancy of the issue and made it positive. Thank you. Again. It was almost healing. It was almost of a healing nature. Thank you. So I just take a break from this. You have a winner here. Yeah? I have a question. Okay. Somebody put in Vince as the speaker, so who did that, please? As the speaker. Yeah. Maybe he got confused about Bill's name. Yes. Right. So just I look a while the other name Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other name Bruce. The two outsiders. There's only one with the Vince on it. I think you can replace that with Bill. Yeah, yeah. 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 So do we have a drum roll? Yeah. Yeah. All right, who's that winner? The winner is Bill. Wow! And that was not the, that was not the tie break, though. So I just wanted to know, so you didn't try to toss that out. Um, <laughs> does anybody else want to maybe chime in a little thing here? OK. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to uh, the way she, um, the way Jane presented it, she had the connectedness. Even well, this start of the fiction from Ray Bradbury, she brought from the transition, brought it to the current event, mm -hmm. mentioned about the, what happened in Paris, what happens here. And, uh, so the, those are the connectivities, the connectedness. That, that is important. That, that was something that I liked. That. Mm -hmm. exactly. So you want me to write here connect connectedness. Transitions. Just transition. 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 From transition. From Whatever she talked about from the fiction to the reality, what is happening now? The way, what is she talking about that? What is important? What is the point she's able to bring yeah. forth? Mm -hmm. The point she was talking about. That, That's important. Yeah, thank you. What she said that. I think that the one area that I was kind of hoping to have comments on where I know that I was falling down a little bit, I did okay with eye contact, but um, body language, I had no body language because it's hard for me to move my, right now. But I had thoughts about where I should do the body language, but just couldn't really do it. But that was something that people, that I think people should talk about because we need to get more involved in blocking our speeches out on the stage. Okay. So body language? Body language, yeah. Okay. But you know, Janet, your speech really didn't need it. No. Yeah. But I, had words, some, I had some kind of plan where but, I did hope But your words were so captivating. But you know, I guess the yeah. free flow of ideas. Mm -hmm. From yeah. this Ray Bradbury's mm -hmm. fiction and butterfly. They went to Paris to connect to what's going on. Right. So that's important. Okay. Yeah. 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 Emmanuel, I yeah. think that a, um, a evaluation should have a beginning, a body, and an end, just like a speech does. Exactly. Okay. So, well, intro, I guess. Yeah. You're right. You're absolutely fine. right. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's just call it intro, body, and conclusion. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you know what that yeah, means. Like, uh, like Bill said, overall, so 10 out of 10. Okay. <laughs> she did a good job. Thank you. Yeah. The, 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 well, the last but not the least that I think is missing here is yeah. reading, which is something that Bill started with very well, reading. OK. And so I, I, I see that beginning body and conclusion also ties into the transitions, which did a, a, a pretty good job of, yeah. of, of moving from, from introduction, body, and then to conclusion. Okay. Go ahead. I'd just like to say it scared me to hear uh, Grace tell Janet that it would be an improvement if she didn't use notes because, oh my gosh, now I have to do no notes. <laughs> well, I, this particular speech you have to I know. worked so hard on that I didn't want to miss anything. This yeah. is the first speech where in years that I really feel like I've <coughs> prepared. Well, as you know, some speeches require notes, and this was one of them because you wanted to get your facts correct. I just wanted to make real sure that I didn't miss anything. Yeah, and, and I respect that, but as you know, right, it's better I have no notes. Yeah, I had to. But here's what I did, just wanted to just kind of show you, is I highlighted and bolded the parts that I wanted to make absolutely sure I didn't miss or that were transitions into the next section, so that when I looked down, I could jump to it, the next dark part. Hopefully I missed out all the lighter parts and covering before I skipped. So 
Thank you so much. The, the goal I was trying to bring out here is the fact that we, we already have a, good, a pretty much good idea of what it takes to give a very solid evaluation of a speech. Going by what we've seen here, and so next thing, let's now take a look at what I've come up with, which is what I've used, and is also what I've heard, is also what I've seen in, in this contest that I've been to. So, I wasn't thinking about it, but that's, oh, okay, all right. So let me do that. Okay, good idea. All right. Nice. Smart, smart <laughs> guys <Yeah. laughs> All right, so I think we have greetings on there on the board. I think I added that there. I've always noticed that contestants that get up there and do a very solid greeting of recognizing the contest chair, Mr. or Mrs. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, panel of judges, honored guests, and Janet. What a fabulous speech. So, 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 yeah, so, so basically, you have to start out greeting. You, you know, it's just one of the protocols. It just makes you come out so sharp, like you're about to really deliver a very good evaluation. So greeting is one thing, and then it's okay to talk about the contents of the story. There's nothing wrong with that. They just don't dwell on it so much, because then you're, you know, then you're taking time away from actually delivering what you're supposed to deliver. But, so that's why I put the only 5%, because at the end of the day, you only have, what, three minutes to give these evaluations? And so 5% is what? I don't know, maybe 20 seconds of your time. So, so that's why I'm talking about the story, you know. But, but just give it only 5% of your time. <coughs> then you get into the introduction. What did you like about the opening of the speech? From the introduction of the speech, here's what you said, and that drew us in right away. I like that. Kudos on that. And then you go in, and then you go in, you connected with the audience, you made so much eye contact with the audience, your volume was not too much for the room, your pitch was appropriate for the room, and then you just go in. What were the things that you liked about the introduction? So I'm, I really want to make sure that you can see this. Yeah, so what did you like? Did the speaker connect with the audience? Eye contact, vocal variety, comfort on stage. How did the speaker move around on stage? was he or she just fixed at one spot. And then you move on to the body. Again, what did you like about the body? You know, you said this and that was funny, or that made us really feel so sorrowful. That made us really feel so sympathetic. I applaud you for that. Your gestures, your facial expressions, it was awesome, I thought it was remarkable. And this was the selling point. I think I was sold, I think everybody else was sold when you said this. Or we, everybody just fell out on the floor just laughing when you said this. So what, what was that selling point? You have to say. And at some point, I, I believe as I go down to maybe I think rule number five or six, we'll see how we can capture all of these things. Because I mean, it seems like it's a lot of things, but you can actually capture these things. Next thing is the conclusion. What did the speaker say that signaled the conclusion? I noticed that as you moved to the conclusion, you said this, and I thought that was remarkable. You really made us now see that you're getting to the end, to the end of your speech. And the ending of your speech actually brought us back to the beginning of your speech. It was full circle. I thought that was excellent. And the whole time you're doing this, even though you're also looking at the audience, but you want to pay more attention to the speaker as well. And we'll see that as we go down. Next thing is suggestion for improvement. So like I said earlier, Toastmasters requires at least one suggestion for improvement. The reason I say not more than two uh, is because then it, it, it I don't know, I've just, it's just from experience. When people get into suggesting three, four, five suggestions, it's just like, really? So I, I like, personally, I, I, I like not to do more than two suggestions, if you can. And then, very, very, this, this, this is the one line that, that, that just makes you stand out. What a fabulous speech. Thank you so much for your speech. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed listening and evaluating your speech. I look forward to more speeches from you. Thank you. Or I can't wait to listen to your next speech. You know, however you want to coin it. So, yeah, so there it is. You know, this is the knowledge that 
that we all try to capture, that we all try to break it down, we all try to make it look solid, look it, and, 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 and once you have it this way, it gives you that confidence. And so rule number five is obviously greetings, story content, what did the speaker say in the introduction? How did she begin her speech? The body of the speech, what did she say? What was the punchline? How did it make the audience feel? We all laughed, well, depending on if it's a funny speech. Or we all felt, I mean, we, we almost had theory eye, depending on if, on if it's a sorrowful mm -hmm. speech. And conclusion, suggestions for improvement, thanks, and closing remarks. Now, so we've covered five rules, right? What was rule number one? Does anybody know what rule number one was? Like the like speech like right like you do. Yeah, you, yeah you, you either like it or you force yourself to like it. Rule number two. You have to package, you have to package it. And present Gold it. with a little blemish, a little tarnish. Mm -hmm. Rule number three. You have to complete it. Win. 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 Number four. The more you compete, the more you improve. And now number five is the greetings and everything. I think we should give ourselves a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, listen and take notes like your life depends on it. I mean, if you really want to win a contest, really. Listen and take notes like your life depends on it. Also, as they walk you out to where you're waiting, before you get called in to give your evaluation, you have to rehearse. One of the things I see that happens a lot, and I wish maybe Toastmaster has a way of preventing this, I mean Toastmaster is international, is that when the evaluators go out, and I, I mean at this point, you're thinking about what you heard, you're taking notes, you're now trying to bring it all together to now say something meaningful, but then you have the people that are, that are responsible to keep you there, I think the sergeant of arms, trying to chit chat with you. Like, really? Dude, I have so much in my head right now. Could you just, you know, I, I see that as being distracting because they go, so how do you write the speech? Uh, a lot of times when that happens to me, I'm like, I just try to cut it down and then I try to just focus on, on just rehearsing on what I heard. Because that's the only time you have to rehearse, you know. What are you going to say? How are you going to say it? So then why should you be distracted then? So anyway, that's just my take on it. So you rehearse, and then when you are now giving the evaluation, you know, I say pay more attention to the speaker when you speak, because obviously you are trying to evaluate the speaker. So it's good to, you know, you know, look the speaker in the eye and then give all the criticisms and then give the suggestions. Also, last but not least, when you see yellow, you have to wrap up. <laughs> I actually lost a, um, an area contest competition. I heard later on, I heard later after the contest that I should have won, but I went over time. I went over time. I was so energetic that day. I had been to the gym. I had so much coffee going on. I was just all over the place. So I got up there and I just went off. And I think I saw the yellow card, but I just I still went on and on and on and then I lost the contest. So yeah, so when you see yellow, you wanna wrap up. You wanna try to okay, now it's time to just get to the conclusion, get to the end and get out. Because you don't wanna lose simply because you run out of time. Again, these are just the rules that I've used. I hope that we all took notes. I really you know, hope that we can all put this to use. I've, I've used this. I'm still going to keep on using it, probably refine it a little bit, and maybe continue to win more countries. But I really want a, a lot of us, you know, members of our club, maybe <coughs> tax talkers as well, you know, to try to incorporate some of these rules, if not all of these rules. And in doing so, you stand a better chance of winning a country. So, any questions? I just have one comment. Okay. I brought a picture of the cover of Charlie Hebdo with, I printed it this morning, someone took it off the printer. Oh, so that's why wow. it's not here. Oh. I hope they enjoy it. I hope they enjoy it too. Yeah. One, uh, one more such, if you could send us the PowerPoint, the yeah. email. Okay, us. okay. Uh, 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 Chris? Could you please tell them that I purposely had an awful, uh, <laughs> what did say? I hated to say those things, oh, Jan. Yeah. 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 You know, actually, in honesty, I sort of was sitting here thinking, well, she did that on purpose, didn't she? We, did. yeah, <laughs> we, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, true. Oh, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. yeah. I, I, mean, so I was wondering, why did she say she could should use any, an illustration? Well, she did use an illustration. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions, comments? Was this helpful? Very nice. Very helpful. Thank you. I will send this out by email. Thank you. Thank you.